it should mean, uh, and particularly what it means, it's, uh, as I'll explain, it's a concept which comes from looking at global food security, and the question is how should we interpret it here in Europe? I start with a European perspective, because that's just the way I am, this is where I've spent the last 40 years worrying about European agricultural policy, because we're in Europe, and that's where policy is decided. So how should we interpret this concept here in Europe, uh, and then how should it appear on the ground? And Nick specifically uh, asked me to address the question, uh, and does organic farming fit the bill? So I certainly want to say a few words about how I see it fits into the spectrum uh, of approaches which I would class as indicating sustainable intensification. So I'll start with the motivation. Why, did, why do we talk about this now? Why has it come on to the national and international policy discussion forum uh, that, that sustainable intens intensification of agriculture is the way ahead? And where it comes from, it seems to me, is very simple-minded. It's land-based and it starts with global food security. Uh, and, and it's a presumption that uh, uh, in the context of continuing population and economic growth in the world, and the dietary changes that tend to accompany uh, economic growth, when people get richer, they change what they eat, uh, um, and in the context of climate change, the argument is that in order to uh, uh, feed this uh, increasing population, and wealthier population, uh, and in order to avoid unacceptable damage of ecosystems and climate, those two things, that more of the any additional output that's needed should come from the additional agricultural area of the world rather than bringing into cultivation land that is currently forest grass, natural grasslands or wetlands. That's the proposition. And the reason behind the proposition is that uh, to, do, to not follow the path of sustainable intensification would be more environmentally damaging. Bringing more uh, grasslands, wetlands, or forests uh, into agriculture that will create more climate damage, more biodiversity damage, uh, and therefore the judgment is. And I've not seen this. Uh, well, two things about this. First of all, I've not seen that question frontally addressed on a global scale, and yet neither have I seen anyone contradict that statement that it's preferable to sustainably intensify an existing area uh, uh, rather than bring more land into cultivation. And the other point that I, I make here is that, and this is in the context where world agriculture is generally speaking economically weak and environmentally damaging. I mean, I just start that from two observations. If you ask me, I can justify those statements. It's certainly true in Britain and Europe, uh, uh, and the weakness in Britain and Europe is mostly addressed by uh, giving farmers handouts, by giving subsidies. In other parts of the world, uh, it's dealt with by farmers being poor. Um, not everywhere, but... Uh, General statement. Now, this is another statement I feel I always have to make when talking about sustainable intensification. I started the argument from global food security. I will immediately acknowledge <coughs> that the problem of global food security is not just a production issue, it's a consumption issue too. Uh, <coughs> however, I'm only going to talk about the production side because I guess that's what most of the people in this room and most of the people in most of the rooms that I'm talking at uh, are interested in the agricultural production side of issues rather than food chain farmers and consumer behaviour. Um, that that uh, there are huge consumption challenges, particularly waste diets and health, and the connection between health and ill health and diets. However, the subjects of uh, those concerns are consumers and the food industry, and the food distribution system and the food service industry, uh, and the policy instruments are targets, information, uh, potentially economic instruments and regulation, what I'm saying is that those issues lie outside my expertise, so I'm not going to say any more about them, but I am going to say they are important, so I'm putting that on one side. Uh, uh, because there is also a production challenge, and the production challenge concerns the productivity of agriculture, how much food we're getting from it, uh, how it's uh, uh, treating and using water, soil, biodiversity, climate, and cultural landscape. Those are the dimensions that concern me. And the subject here are certainly farmers and other land managers uh, and the immediate upstream industries that provide them with inputs of all kinds as well as process their, immediately process their outputs. And also I include in the subjects for sustainable intensification and needing to think and know about it, researchers, advisors and educators. I think attitude is a great part of what we're discussing here. Uh, and the instruments uh, uh, that, that, that we're going to be using will be agricultural, environmental and research policy. 
There are some other areas of policy, but I, I won't go into them right now. So that's the big picture uh, as to why we talk about sustainable intensification that I don't hear contradicted anywhere that I've been. I've never heard anybody say that, that, that those first motivations were a nonsense or wrong. So the next question is, how do we interpret that, that requirement for sustainable intensification in the context of Europe? And I'll just make four points, four or five, one, two, three, four, five bullets here, five points which come to a conclusion that, that in Europe, when we're talking about sustainable intensification, the focus has to be on the first of those two words, not the second. Why? One, because most of the additional demand that I've mentioned motivates this idea is not going to come from within Europe, it's going to come from outside Europe. Uh, about a third of European countries are already losing population, their population is declining. About a third of their population, uh, that's a third of the 28 member states of Europe, another third will find that their population peaks within the next 20 years and starts to decline. You happen to live in one of the other third of European member states whose population is expected to continue rising to the end of the century, uh, this century. Uh, mostly because we're taking a lot of immigration from the rest of Europe. Uh, uh, amongst other countries, <coughs> as you know, that's a bit of an issue. Most of the global demand will be outside Europe. Second, European agriculture is already amongst the most intensive in the world. Uh, in the report that I've uh, written and published recently, I'll show you the evidence for that, but uh, Europe, Japan and China are the most intensive areas on most measures of intensity of agriculture. And so therefore, the scope to further intensify is less here than almost anywhere else. Um, third, uh, the Europe has a, a, a high global footprint uh, where the biggest importers of, of food in the world. That's a tricky point. I'm not going to develop it any further. The implications of that are not completely straightforward as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and they're not always the obvious ones. Reduce your imports. Uh, because if you produce more here, you better be sure that your environmental impacts of producing more in Europe are less than the uh, relief of the environmental impacts somewhere else. And it's not completely obvious that that is the case mostly because we don't measure it. Um, the next point is that if you look at our history for the last century, we've been doing intensification. The way that, that production has increased in, in, in Europe, including Britain, in the last uh, uh, century uh, has almost entirely been through an increase in the intensity of the existing agricultural area. The European and the British agricultural area are both sequentially going down, systematically going <coughs> down slowly, but they're going down. And not primarily because of uh, urbanisation. Urbanisation only takes a small part of, of land. They're going down uh, because people have intensified production and they're no longer farming areas that, 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 that it's almost certainly it wasn't very intelligent to have farmed them in the first place. They're not very suitable. Uh, and so forest, wetland, and grassland areas in Britain and Europe are increasing, not decreasing. So the fundamental land scarcity argument which I started with is less of a pressure in Europe uh, and therefore uh, uh, it takes us in a different direction. And the fifth and the final bullet as to why uh, the, the conclusion as to where the emphasis in sustainable intensification should be is that the intensification we've observed in the last hundred years has been environmentally damaging. Now, you guys don't need to be told that uh, and, and we know that the evidence on that has taken a long time to accumulate that evidence and for that evidence to be not denied uh, by, by, by the bulk of the farming industry, but the fact is that there has been and there continues to be uh, serious environmental damage associated with intensive farming. So th this is why, in my view, the argument takes you to, the, to, to, to this conclusion that the emphasis has to be on sustainability whilst maintaining productivity growth. Why do I say the last bit? Because we've still got a chance to produce more. So if you say, well, what am I, what is it then? What is sustainable intensification? It means simultaneously improving the productivity <coughs> and environmental management of agricultural land. And in a way, I mean, that is an incredibly general statement. I could have made it any time in the last 40 years, and, and I don't suppose anybody in this room would have disagreed with that statement. Uh, they might question the first part, I don't know. You'll, you'll tell me that uh, 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 in the discussion period. Um, I'm simply saying, this is the recipe for the future. Um, I do see it as a goal or aspiration. And I know that the, the word, as I'll explore a bit, bit more in a moment, that the word intensity is the word that worries most people. 
Uh, and what I'd like to suggest to you is think of the intensification as particularly as increasing the knowledge per hectare. This is the critical thing. We've got to just understand better what it is we're doing when we're using soil uh, and biology and, and the sunshine uh, and carbon and water in order to grow our food. Uh, and, and so that's the challenge, is, is to bring that knowledge, to, more of that knowledge to bear. And of course, the recipe as to what does this formula formulation mean? Uh, the reason I can't be more specific uh, than I have been to this point is because it will be incredibly system and place specific as to what, depending on where you start from, what for you should be your path of sustainable intensification. It will require different actions in different zones depending on what you're already doing and depending on those circumstances. So now let's, let's deconstruct this, this pair of words a little more. I find it fascinating that intensity, which is a ratio, intensity uh, is well defined. There's no difficulty in defining what we mean by intensity. There's lots of different ratios that we can compute to measure the intensity of any particular farming system at a country level, at a farm level, at a field level. Uh, you can measure it at different levels. Um, it's very well defined, it's measurable, and it's popularly denigrated. Generally speaking, an intensive farming system is not a, 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 a phrase which heaps praise on those who are doing it. And I'm arguing that, that world agriculture has to be intensive. Uh, what matters is the implications of that intensity and what accompanies it. Um, the intensities, you can either talk about input intensity, uh, fertilizer use per hectare, labor per hectare, uh, <coughs> management time per hectare, uh, um, uh, the denominator will nearly always be hectares of <coughs> land because we started from a land scarcity concept. That's, that, that was the logic of, of where we came into this debate. What I think is critically important is to distinguish between the intensity, the ratios of environmentally harmful inputs per hectare, uh, making the point that not all inputs are environmentally harmful and not all of fertilizer applications are environmentally harmful depends on the soils, the level of the application, when it's applied, how it's applied, and the crop requirements, I would argue. Um, so we have to distinguish between the inputs with damaging effects versus the rest. Uh, you can also measure intensity in terms of outputs per hectare, and that's what we normally mean by yields, uh, uh, tons per hectare, litres per cow, and so on. Now what I think is that the mind shift that, that most people find very difficult to make particularly conventional agriculture, is that what we've got to train ourselves to do in future is to not just measure the outputs of land management which are marketed and sold, the wheat, the milk, the meat, but the other ecosystem service outputs and outcomes which, generally speaking, are not sold, the market failures. I know Patrick's going to talk about this. And so we should be just concerned when we talk about sustainable intensification for some areas of agriculture e.g. about 40% of European agriculture, which is classified as less favoured, less favoured for agriculture, I would say, generally speaking, more favoured for carbon sequestration, biodiversity management, flood protection, and so on. I think we've got a shocking bit of mis-terminology in our European policy in calling these areas less favoured. In a lot of those areas, the intensification will be conservation outputs per hectare. That's what has to be intensified by more intelligent management. So we're storing more carbon rather than releasing it. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, 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 of activity that measures compound uh, indices of intensity as well. There's a thing the economists like, which is total factor productivity. The point, in, in my view, is that goal is high productivity or resource efficiency. Now, I would have thought that is a phrase that few people would contradict. It's better to use resources efficiently than inefficiently. So I do see that if you accept the arguments which lead you to sustainable intensification in the first place, then we have to detoxify or destigmatize the word intensity by explaining what factors we're intensifying, what outputs we're intensifying, in what situations, and making sure it happens. So it's a curious paradox that the, of the two words, the intensity one is the one that you can measure and define, uh, uh, but everybody hates it, or well, lots of people hate it, uh, sustainability, I've never met anybody who's against uh, being more sustainable or being sustainable. Uh, it's universally loved, uh, uh, but searching <coughs> many, uh, you can find some definitions of it, uh, but finding measurements of it and you enter a minefield. The
Brundtland definition was that sustainability refers to meeting the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. An unsustainable system is a system, a farming system that's described as unsustainable, is in some way undermining its own capability of continuing indefinitely. If the word means anything, that's what it means. If we're simply meaning it's just got some undesirable impacts, I think that's a different concept. Unsustainable means it's undermining its capability of continuing indefinitely. And I think we tend to overuse this word because we haven't defined it very well. People often want to talk about economic, social and environmental uh, uh, sustainability. And some, you will always find that commercial farmers say, without economic viability or sustainability, you can forget the rest. And then you'll find environmentalists saying, without environmental sustainability, you won't be able to make a living. <coughs> I think it's a waste of time arguing which of these is preeminent. The point is that you need all three. Uh, uh, the difficulty is we don't have a map to measure them. Each of those things is multidimensional. So, so sustainability <coughs> is always multifactorial and it's always uh, location specific. And um, we can get into philosophical arguments about it, uh, which don't get us very far. To my mind, the critical thing is if this concept has useful meaning, it's that an unsustainable system is one which, if we're, we're, it's approaching or reached a tipping point or a threshold, we push the system too far, and therefore it's now undermining its own continuation uh, and, uh, because it's gone past some threshold. What are these tipping points or thresholds or irreversibilities? The stunning thing to me is that despite the mountain of research on sustainability, now you can say I'm, I'm hopeless that I didn't look in the right places, but we spent a lot of time looking for analyses, seeking out what these irreversibilities are, not on a global scale, you've got a few indicators of those, although actually, in my view, remarkably few of them, climate is the main one, uh, but, but at a local or a specific, a national or regional scale, uh, research seeking out where these thresholds are and how close we are to them or whether we've exceeded them is notable by its absence. I found one study. Um, and yet, if there are detectable limits for one or more aspects of what's going on, we jolly well ought to be finding them. It's vital that those who are managing the land know if they carry on doing what they're doing in 10 or 15 or 30 years' time, they won't be able to continue. And you would think that this would be the subject of research, or I can tell you that there's very little research that addresses the questions in that way. And furthermore, if a system is unsustainable, either for water reasons, for soil reasons, for biodiversity reasons, native reason, it'll be a specific factor or combination of factors, and therefore there's no point in co constructing a composite in index which buries all these things together. You want to know which factor we're approaching the limit for, and what we should be doing about it to avoid that, to change. Um, so I think average and composite indices, which, which researchers spend a lot of time on, is, is mostly a waste of time. If these limits, uh, either they don't exist, or they just turn out to be too difficult to pinpoint and research, then it still says to me that, that we've still got a problem because European agriculture is not achieving the environmental limits that have been set by, by regulation. We've set uh, water framework directive objectives about good ecological status of water bodies. We've set nitrate directives, birds and habitats directives. We're not meeting most of these directives. <coughs> so that alone says that the environmental performance of agriculture is not good enough. It's not meeting European uh, regulatory uh, uh, targets. And then that, for, that, for that reason alone, therefore, we've got to move towards uh, uh, what you call uh, agricultural systems with higher environmental performance. If you want to use the word sustainability, I can't stop you, and we probably will use that word. So uh, we spend a lot of time in this project, the, the, the producer report that I referred to, looking at uh, papers on, on uh, intensity and sustainability. I found this a dispiriting exercise. There's a huge amount of intellectual effort gone into this, and it seems to me there's no convergence in how you measure sustainability uh, uh, at all. Uh, and furthermore, <coughs> every new study that does it invents its own indices, its own variables, uh, uh, and, and I just feel that, that we're going in circles in, in, in that area. And yet there's been a lot of public funds put into uh, devising uh, uh, indicator sets for the environment. Why aren't we using them? So given that set of arguments, what are the actions to move to more sustainable, uh, to, to, onto a sustainable intensification development path for, for European agriculture? 
Uh, to my mind, there's both collective actions and there's individual actions. The collective <coughs> actions are the policy changes. And I think that should start with indicators of environmental performance, particularly at the farm level. We still make far too few efforts. We, we go into enormous effort to measure economic performance at the farm level. We spend a lot of money on the farm business survey doing this. We don't have comparable surveys on a systematic, regular, annual basis for environmental performance. And it does seem to me that you can't expect people to manage what, they have, what hasn't been measured and for which there are not clear benchmarks. Uh, then we move into the policy area. Uh, I, I've just flagged up there. There's all of us. My point here about policy is I don't think there's some magic set of policy instruments that we haven't yet discovered. We've got uh, research and development and education policy. We've got environmental policy. We've got a common agricultural policy which tries to green payments to offer agri-environment payments and it offers uh, cross-compliance conditions. We've got that battery of instruments. We're not working any of them optimally in my view. But I don't think there's, there's, a, there's a missing tool in the, in the toolbox. It's a question of will to make the ones that we have got work better. There's a lot of individual actions. Why wait for policy? Why not just get on and do it? And no doubt people in the room will say we are. Uh, and so if you'll see in the report that we say, well, one thing you can do is adopt a, a farming system which is labelled sustainable. At least it's making some conscious effort to move in that direction. So I've listed what I would say are six sustainable farming systems that we, we, we look into, one of which, of course, is organic farming. Um, you don't have to uh, adopt the whole package. You can adopt some of the practices that, 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 uh, uh, that, that generally make up those systems, and, and we look at uh, long lists of those. Again, uh, this isn't rocket science. This, this is cover crops and rotations uh, and, and, and other things, that, uh, mixed farming, things that are the core of, 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 of what the organic movement uh, has pushed for. I think there will be a need to, weigh, to find ways for farmers to work collaboratively uh, on a lot of, the, uh, of this venture, because I think landscape scale delivery will require management of land and, and natural resources and natural capital on a wider scale than the individual farm. That's another task we have to learn how to do. Um, and there are other things you can do through private certi certification schemes, uh, of which the organic uh, at mark is one, uh, or by trying to embody environmental value in the products that you sell. I know Patrick will talk, I suspect, about that. I do think, though, I come back to that if you're not measuring uh, the environmental performance at the farm level, you shouldn't be all that surprised that the farmers aren't managing uh, uh, the environment as well as they could do. And I think that, that, that we have to put uh, a lot more effort into that. I was very impressed when I found this data because getting hard data is very difficult in this area. This is some data, it comes from Germany, but, it, but the, the study uh, did this for several countries, that plots crop yields uh, on the horizontal axis, uh, numbers of plant species, biodiversity, a very crude measure of biodiversity, on the vertical axis. And each plot is an individual holding uh, in Germany, this particular data. And what strikes me is exactly as you <coughs> expect, there's huge variability in the data. For any yield figure, four tons per hectare, there's a biodiversity variability of fivefold between the worst and the best, between five and 25 species uh, per hectare. And in a sense, I, I'm heartened by this. I mean, there may be, what we need to know is what's behind that variability. But the point is that this variability, or you take any biodiversity level, you can see there's a tremendous range in yield that's being achieved. Sustainable intensification means moving closer to that frontier, either horizontally or vertically, producing more output without any biodiversity loss, more biodiversity without any yield loss. And the fact that some people are doing it, why can't more people do it? And the existence of that variability says to me there is enormous scope within European agriculture to maintain productivity whilst improving environmental performance. And if we had this kind of data for more variables, for more plots, and the people who are managing those plots were more aware of it, I think you'd get different outcomes. Um, I'm running out of time. So, does organic farming fit the bill? And of course, it, I mean, I've explicitly said it, and I didn't just invent it for this presentation, it's there in the report, of course it has a role to play. Um, and I do assert, nobody thinks that all food production should be organic, do they? Yes. yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry.
conversion to organic, which generally, but doesn't always, involve some outward sacrifice, generally offers an increase in other ecosystem services. And what I'm saying is, on many areas of land, that can be the optimal part. Um, but not all, what I'm arguing. This is what we'll debate. So it's a route to supply other ecosystem services in addition to food. Uh, the problem is the apparently limited market, or some problems are the, the apparently limited market growth. It's certainly stabilised in, in, in Britain. Uh, and in other words, when consumers are offered the chance to pay more for organic produce and contribute to environmental management, only a small fraction of them take up that, 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 that uh, take advantage of that. Uh, and another problem is the high degree of dependence on public payments. That's true for all agriculture. It's particularly true for the livestock part of organic agriculture, which is a big part of organic agriculture in this country. The, the upland, well, grazing livestock systems are notoriously dependent, more dependent on public payments uh, than, than some other systems of farming. And, uh, I mean, this is, Patrick is going to discuss this. So, my conclusions. Sustainable identification, to me, is a useful, globally-based concept for a better balance between food production and the environment. And its logic, to my mind, is, 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 is unarguable. Um, it means maintaining productivity growth with a step change in environmental performance, but the prescription depends on where you are and what you're doing. I think we've got to spend a lot more effort on detecting environmental thresholds and warning those who are approaching them they've really got to change what they're doing. And I think you will get change if you're able to demonstrate that. Uh, and, of course, it means better enforcement of, of the existing instruments and better use of the existing, the, the, the existing instruments we've got. And because organic farming is a well-established <coughs> system, uh, um, of course, it has a role to play in this because you subscribe, uh, it seems to me, <coughs> very overtly to, to what it is I'm talking about. Uh, we've, uh, I've converged 